Pile Driver is the horse of dreams. Unsold as a foal, he is now a Royal Ascot Group 2 winner and is on target for the Epsom Derby. His dam, La Pile, boards a Carisbrook stud and her co-owner, Guy Leach, tells us what it's like to own a mare like her as well as a Derby prospect. So, uh, Guy, thank you so much for joining TDN on a Zoom call. Many congratulations on Paul Driver's success at Royal Ascot. Um, thank we'll you. just start with that, maybe. Just um, how does it feel to, ha- to own a Royal Ascot winner? Very exciting <laughs> and a big surprise as well because uh, there was no way, even four weeks ago, that we thought we'd be running at Royal Ascot. So, it all happened very quickly uh, and all very special, very, very special. Um, and we'll we'll just go back to his dam and kind of I suppose how the whole story started. Um, how did you come to own La Pile? So Philip Hobbs bought her off the flat in France, where she'd shown some uh, ability. She'd won a couple of races. Uh, the idea was for her to go hurdling, and um, unfortunately, she had quite a nasty uh, accident at the at the training yard. Required some surgery and subsequently really disappointed. And we were going to sell her. And Kevin Mercer, uh, a very good friend of mine, sadly no longer with us, who owned a Valley Stud, suggested we might consider breeding from her because she had very good black race pedigree. It's a kind of obvious now why you sent her to Harbour Watch, but maybe just go back to the very, you know, when you were planning her first mating and, and um, why he was the stallion of choice. It all happened very quickly because it, it wasn't until January... 2016, that La Pile went to um, to Us Valley. Kevin gave us the Weatherby Stallion book and said, "Go away and read that overnight." And so, like it, it, it we, we relied a lot on Kevin. Kevin gave us a bit of a short list. He talked us all through it. He took us up to Green Hills. We went and saw Harbour Watched, fabulous physical specimen. Uh, there was nothing very scientific to it at all. Uh, I'm afraid it's luck, absolute luck. Um, well, that's well. It's a beautiful story, though, and it's obviously worked out. Um, so obviously, you know, it has worked out. I mean, it, it's a bit of an interesting. It is a bit of an interesting story, just in terms of him as a foal and kind of what he went through and what you guys went through. So, can you just take us through, like, you know, from when he was born and to to what he's achieved now? Well, it's just been a wonderful journey, as you can imagine. We've loved every minute of it, really, and. Um, Super to go and watch him growing up. He was born at Us Valley uh, and raised there until he was sort of 19, 20 months old when he went, when he went to, to William to be broken. Um, William always liked him, to be fair. Um, having said that, if I step back a little bit, the original plan, our plan, would have been to sell the Colts and to keep the Phillies. Um, but by the time we came to take him to the sales, two things had happened. One was that Harbour Watch was very much out of fashion, out of favour. Nobody wanted his progeny, so they were very difficult to sell. But on the other hand, um, the Piles page had improved immensely because her half-brother Montormel had won the Grand Prix de Paris. Her full sister, Normandel, was Group 3 placed to 2, and she actually did subsequently go on to win a Group 3 and listed level. But um, so when we went to the sales... Uh, we really went there to see what we could achieve. And we, was, we were certainly wouldn't have been very willing sellers because we were very keen to protect her page. Um, we realized that we had a valuable asset in the mayor uh, and we wanted really to look after her through her first fold and, and to really guide his career. Uh, what, what we dreaded was him being sold for nothing, going abroad and, and never to be heard of again. And I mean, he's he's been a fantastic racehorse for you. We've, we've talked about the Royal Ascot success, but just sum up his career to date for us. He went to William, as I said, about 20 months old, was broken there. William always liked him. Uh, he was very much a very laid back individual, a great mover. Um, but having said that, he was a very weak, sort of uh, tall, weak, gangly two-year-old. And uh, William always saw him really as work in progress. And and so when we went to Salisbury for his first run, we, we weren't expecting huge things. Um, and he was 50 to one. And I don't know what he was, but he would have been a huge prize to turn on out. He finished very strongly and won that day. And we realized we did have a good horse. We went straight to listed level from then. 
Um, he he ran creditably in the in the Denford Stakes, was fourth, but uh, it was probably under his his best trip, seven furlongs, and then he won the Ascended Stakes over eight next time out. Um, and then we probably foolishly pushed it too far. He was a weak individual, and we went to the Royal Lodge. And uh, it was one, it was one race too many, but fortunately Martin Dwyer was on him and just eased off him and and looked after him really. Uh, and then of course moving on to his three year old career, William was very keen to go slowly with him again because he still saw him as as work in progress really. Um, and his idea was to go to the Craven, see what he was like over a mile, treat it very much as a trial, and then make a decision on where we wanted to go. We had made some entries. Uh, he always said that if he stood, if he did stay a mile and a half, he would be a very good horse. So we did have him into the Grand Prix de Paris, for instance. Uh, and then COVID changed everything. Um, so we we went to the classic trial, really, because we were keen to give him an early run. There weren't many options. Hempton certainly wouldn't have been our first choice because it was a tight track. And to compound matters, he was drawn nine of nine. Uh, he ran a brilliant race, really. His with three furlongs, within three furlongs to go, till three, he was he was lying last. He had the whole field in front of him and a short finishing straight, and he managed to get within a, a you know length and a quarter of the winner. So we were very pleased with that run. But more importantly, Martin came out of it saying he thought he'd stay a mile and a half, and that's what brought uh, the King Edward the Seventh and the Derby really into reckoning. Although William did say it was an either or. At that stage, he didn't think he'd be strong enough to take both. And so we decided to have a look at the um, King Edward VII, see what we thought. When the declarations were being made, we liked the look of the race. Thought he had a good chance of being placed, and, and of course we went for it. Yeah, very good. And it worked out well. Um, so, I mean, now he's... he's um on target for Epsom, how, how is he in himself and, and you know, how are prep, how's preparation going, I suppose? Yeah, no, eh, again, in, in the back of our minds, you, you worry about running three races in four and a half weeks. So uh, it is very, very much William's decision as to if he thinks the horse is right or not. But having said that, he is pleased with the way he's come out of the race. He's taken it well. He's making good progress. And I'd say that we're on course, you know, and, and barring a mishap or something going wrong now, uh, we're 99% certain to be running in the derby. Uh, they say it's the ultimate test of the racehorse just because of the track itself. You know, yeah. how, how are both you and William kind of feeling about, you know, the Epsom track? Do you think he would he would handle it? You've mentioned there that he, you know, he was a bit immature and, and you know, you do want to make sure that he's he's perfect for it. Is the track something that you're really thinking about a lot? Well, you know, I rely on William and Martin and they, I mean, they don't know. Nobody knows until they actually go and do it, but they think he has every chance because he's such a well-balanced horse uh, and a relaxed individual. Um, they're very hopeful that he will go. Very good. Yeah. Um, we'll just go back to La Pile. Um, what, what's her progeny been since she's had Pile Driver? So... Um, things changed for us, of course, because all of a sudden we thought we had something that was a valuable, a valuable mare. So she's got a really exciting uh, two-year-old filly by New Approach called Country Pile, who's in training with William, and William is excited about her. I know that. Uh, again, he's going to take his time. Um, with COVID, we, we put her back out for the spring. We gave her a break during April, May, so she's been back in probably three three weeks, something like that, maybe four. So we see her running, I hope, middle of August, but again, William will make that decision as, as and when he thinks she's ready. Uh, following her, we've got an Oasis Dream Colt Yearling. Uh, we have an absolutely gorgeous Frankel Billy Foal, who's about eight weeks old now, uh, and she's in Foal to Kingman. So we've got lots to look forward to. Definitely. And um, I know the two-year-old is in training um, in your ownership, but what are you thinking for the Oasis Dream Yearling and the Franco Philly? What, what's, what, are you going to keep them? Are you going to sell them? Well, going back to the original plan, uh, we'll definitely keep the fillies. 
but there is a financial reality to it all, obviously. Um, having said that, if our driver keeps winning money, we might win the Colts as well. You know, it's 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 that financial reality. You can't keep plowing money in. Um, but he's obviously exceeded our expectations in both in performance and obviously financial return already. Very good. And uh, finally, Guy, you know, for you and and your and your co-owners in the pile and pile driver and, and her progeny, I mean, what does it what does it mean to have a mare like her and, and a horse like pile driver? <laughs> I'm still pinching myself. Um, you know, I, We've been around horses long enough to know that this is not the norm. Uh, it's uh, it's it, it's been described as a fairy tale, but it really is because we've had. What's so nice about it really is is we've had so much help and support all along the way from Kevin and Sue and Us Valley and his staff. Uh, William's been terrific. He because Lapile is now at Carisbrook. William. William helped us find, in fact, it was his decision, his recommendation that we went to Carisbrook. Um, again, very, very happy with the way the horses are looked after there by Martin Grattick and his crew. Um, wonderful to see William, Williams and, and Maria, his head girl, the patience they had in breaking uh, pile driver. There was no stress at all on the horse at any stage. Uh, he, he did it all in his old time, own time, although it was all it was all very quickly. But um, no, it's it's just lovely to you know you you see them from an hour. Well, I didn't actually see him personally, but photographs from an hour old and videos from an hour old to the following day when you go to see him, and um, and he just keeps surpassing any expectation we have of him. Really, um, no, it's wonderful. Perfect. Well, look, I, I hope that he runs a massive race for you at Epsom and uh, thank you so much for your time and hopefully Lapal keeps keeps the fairy tale alive and keeps giving you wonderful racehorses. Thank you very much. Thank you.